Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to our lecture on the Dutch Golden Age, Unit 3, Section 5. So today's objectives are pretty simple. This actually is going to be a fairly short lecture since we're just looking at the country of the Netherlands in the 17th century. Now, of the three objectives, the first one is really the most important. Uh, that is to explain the factors that contributed to the development of the Dutch Republic. So this period of history that we're looking at, Netherlands in the 1700s, they really were known as the Dutch Republic. So again, that's our primary objective. But there's always going to be some secondary objectives to help us understand this content in relation to other course content and the context and everything like that. So we're going to be talking about some commercial and agricultural developments. We're also going to be talking about how the Dutch participated in the development of international trade networks and participated in colonial expansion. We've already touched upon that a bit in uh, Unit 1 when we talked about the Age of Exploration, but we're going to be revisit revisiting some of those same ideas in this lecture today. We got a lot of key concepts that we're going to cover. This is really the only page of key concepts, so I decided to put all of them right there. And the biggest and most important key concept is that first one you see, which is 2.1.2.b. The Dutch Republic, established by a Protestant revolt against the Habsburg monarchy, developed an oligarchy of urban gentry and rural landholders to promote trade and protect traditional rights. So again, that's the most important one, but definitely the other ones are relevant. As you will see, these key concepts usually can hit a couple different points in history. So we'll be talking about religious pluralism in this lecture. Uh, we'll be talking about the development of binary of banking and finance and the growth of urban financial centers. Um, we're definitely, like I said, going to be talking about the establishment of colonies and trade works, the competition that results from that trade in the, those colonies. And we will even talk a little bit about Louis XIV, although only briefly because we have a very long, thorough lecture devoted to him later in this unit. And since we're doing kind of a comprehensive overview on a single nation, which is the Netherlands in the 17th century, we're actually going to be hitting kind of like all the basic themes here, economic, political, and social. We'll wait and discuss Dutch art in another top in another lecture when we go over Northern Baroque art. So let's get started on exactly what, the, what happened in the Netherlands in the 17th century. Well, the 17th century is known as the Dutch Golden Age for several important reasons. And really, we're looking at like the first half of the century. By the time we get into the second half of the 17th century, which is the 1600s, we'll start to see that there's lots of wars and conflicts and more competition with trade that will contribute to the eventual decline of the Netherlands, which we'll also talk about today. But first, I just want to go over this idea of the golden age once again. So a golden age can happen in many different places, many different countries throughout history. It's essentially when there is a height, like a peak of cultural and economic achievement uh, for that country. And we've already talked about one golden age in European history. That was the 16th century for Spain, which was known as the Siglo de Oro. Uh, we'll also see uh, England having a really amazing golden age in the 19th century. You could argue that the, that the United States saw its golden age in the 20th century. So periodically we will run into these time periods. Italy's Quattrocento was probably its golden age as well, now that I think about it. But the Golden Age of the Netherlands also coincided with the major population boom, um, not just because of like increased birth rates, but also because lots of migration into the Netherlands, which we'll talk about later in this lecture. And even though the Netherlands are a small country, we really can't discount their influence. Uh, Dutch attitudes and ideas really played an important role in the shaping of a new and modern worldview. There's many elements of Dutch culture and Dutch values that we can still see reminiscent even in our own American society today. So 
I also want to take a moment to talk about the historical context of this Dutch Republic of the 17th century uh, and kind of remind you about how the Dutch Republic came about. So the area that we now know as the Netherlands and Belgium, which are sometimes together referred to as the low countries, as in low, like they're below sea level, that region became a possession of Charles V in 1516. So he inherited the Netherlands-Belgium region, which collectively was just called the Netherlands at the time, in 1516, because, as we know, he inherited almost half of Europe. When he divided his empire, the Netherlands remained a Spanish possession, and so it was passed on to his son, Philip II. Now, you might remember that Philip II was the most Catholic king. He saw it as his main objective to restore uh, Catholicism across Europe and stamp out Protestantism. Well, it just so happens that the northern provinces of the Netherlands, which are the modern-day Netherlands, had started to become Protestant. And Philip would not stand for that. Of course, this was his possession. And so he did everything he could to try to get rid of Protestantism in those northern provinces and reimpose Catholicism. He even introduced the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which, of course, was not only unexpected, but really unpopular. So the northern provinces revolted against Spanish rule due to these religious differences, but also they were really frustrated being a possession of Spain. They had to pay taxes to Spain, and their taxation uh, went to go pay for, pay for Spain's wars. This isn't that dissimilar from some of the grievances of the American Revolution when you think about how American colonists were frustrated with taxation and their taxes were going to pay for Britain's wars. Um, so that was a simil that's a similarity that we can understand. So due to this religious difference and the frustration with taxation, uh, the Dutch people of the northern provinces, not the southern, but just the northern, began a revolt in 1568. And by 1579, they declared themselves a fully independent country in a document called the Union of Utrecht. And you can think of the Union of Utrecht as kind of like our Declaration of Independence because the United States declared its independence from Great Britain, but then that created the Revolutionary War, which carried on for several more years. And the U.S. wasn't truly independent from British rule until they had won the war several years later. But according to the Dutch, this is their Declaration of Independence. This is their moment where they rebel permanently against Spanish authority. And so at this point, we can now start calling them the United Provinces. But again, these are the northern provinces only. Those are what will make up the modern Netherlands. And one thing that's a little bit confusing is that the United Provinces, the Dutch Republic, and the Netherlands are all the same thing. It's three different words for the same thing. I know that's confusing, but just get used to it. United Provinces equal Dutch Republic equal Netherlands. If we're referring to the Southern Netherlands, which is modern day Belgium, we will specifically say the Southern ne Netherlands or Flanders or Belgium. Again, another region with three names to make it extra confusing for us. So anyways, the Netherlands, meaning the main one we're talking about right now, achieved de facto independence by 1581. That means for all intents and purposes, they were independent from Spain. They weren't officially and legally independent. That would not occur until 1648 when their independence was recognized by the international European community in the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, but even though that is 80 years later, hence this is why that rebellion is sometimes referred to as the 80 Years War, it really wasn't like an active, engaging war, um, because for most of that time, the Dutch were basically independent already. It was kind of like a cold war between the Netherlands and Spain. But still, we sometimes refer to that as the 80 Years War. So just recognize that even though they were de facto independent, official independence did not come until the Treaty of Westphalia, which is one of the many reasons the Treaty of Westphalia is a very important document in European history. Now, one of the reasons this is significant 
is because the Dutch Revolt is one of the first successful succession successions, meaning like a separation from another country. So like a colony separating from its other country. This is one of the first successful separations in all of European history, especially modern history. And they also became one of the first republics in modern Europe. We really have not seen a republic on this scale before. We saw a few Italian city-states as republics, but that was basically it. Not, no full-on country has gone uh, and become a republic. So a little bit about the uh, structure of the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, as we will now call it. It established an oligarchy of urban gentry and rural landholders to promote trade and protect traditional rights. So let's just clarify a few vocabulary words there. Oligarchy means the rule of a few. So this was not a democratic society. This is when a handful of wealthy merchants uh, or landowners uh, basically held power. You can think of it as similar to the structure of some of the Italian city-states like Florence, which also was a republic that was really an oligarchy. And remember, gentry, that usually refers to landowners, merchants that are wealthy but don't necessarily have fancy titles. And so they created a government essentially to protect their own self-interest. Um, and also, the Netherlands had an exceptionally high concentration of merchants and financiers and traders concentrated into urban areas. We will see that the Netherlands, because it's a small but also wealthy country, had really high levels of urbanization for the time period. So the government was dominated by the bourgeoisie, that refers to sort of like the upper middle class, the, the wealth, the new money, not classic nobility, but generally, again, merchants, traders, financiers, businessmen, people like that. So it was dominated by the bourgeoisie whose wealth and power limited the power of the state. So they really wanted to control the government, again, to benefit themselves, to pursue their own uh, their own issues and protect their own self-interest. Um, so this meant that the government was a representative in institution, but again, it was a representative institution for the bourgeoisie. These people are, this is not a democratic society. Um, the lower classes of the Netherlands really did not have much say in the government. So the overall, so the Netherlands also had a federal level government and then also kind of state governments, much like we have here in the United States. So their federal uh, level, level government was called the Estates General, which I'll talk about. But basically, as you can see here on this map, there, the government was this organized confederation, as I mean by a federal government, made up of seven provinces. You can think of those provinces like states. And each state had its own representative government. Now, the representative government at the federal level, so for all of the provinces, that was called the Estates General. You can think of it as like a, a federal assembly, kind of like a Senate or a House of Representatives or a Parliament, something like that. Now, of the provinces, um, Holland and Zealand were the two richest and most influential. And if you look in you, to see where Holland and Zealand are on the map, you'll notice that they are both coastal provinces. And since the Dutch Republic received a lot of its wealth and power through sea trade, um, this makes sense that they were the most uh, powerful and wealthy provinces and therefore had a lot of influence. Now, each province and the cities in that province were usually pretty autonomous, meaning they were self-sufficient, they were self-governing. Each province had a great deal of political, economic, and social autonomy, meaning, again, independence. And they tended to resist attempts at centralization because centralization reminded them of Spanish authoritarian rule from the 1500s. Now, also, each province elected a stadholder. Uh, you can think of a stadholder kind of like as a governor and military leader. He's basically the highest executive in the province, sort of like the governor of a state. 
and he was responsible for maintaining order and then also representing that province in the Estates General. Although it does get a little bit more complicated than that, but we don't have to worry about that for our purposes. However, during times of crisis, like when they're at war and they're being invaded by the French or attacked by the English, which happens lots of times, unfortunately. So during these times of crisis, all seven provinces would elect the same stadholder. So it's sort of a single executive with more power than usual. And this uh, special stadholder was almost always from the House of Orange. Now, the House of Orange was one of the more powerful families in Dutch history. Even the current Dutch monarchy is actually part of the House of Orange. And not surprisingly, the, the House of Orange frequently tried to push the Dutch Republic towards greater centralization because they wanted to establish a hereditary monarchy. So, for example, when we were talking about uh, William and Mary in the Glorious Revolution, that William was from the he was a stadholder in the Netherlands from the House of Orange. He had wanted a monarchy in the Netherlands. The Netherlands resisted that, so he got one in England instead, which is uh, honestly probably a better deal. So another important thing to know about the Dutch Republic is that it was characterized by religious toleration, one of the only regions in Europe, especially during the 16th and 17th centuries, that embraced religious toleration. Now, despite that, it is important to know that Calvinism was the dominant religion. All right. So when you think of the Dutch, you have to remember that they are primarily Calvinist. But even within Calvinism, there were two different factions. There was a split between the Dutch Reformed Church, who really were the majority and the most powerful. They were the most traditional Calvinists, modeled after um, Calvinism in Geneva, Switzerland, Scotland, places like that. But then there also was another faction that we see in many different parts of Europe called the Arminian faction. Now, Arminianism essentially is Calvinism without the belief in predestination. It still shares a lot of the ideas of the Reformed Church and the almighty power of God and things like that, um, but it doesn't believe in predestination. Don't worry too much about knowing Arminianism because it's unlikely to come up on an exam. Still, Arminian, Arminians consisted of much of the merchant class, and even though they initially began as a minority within Calvinism, they were granted full rights in the Netherlands after 1632. So again, that's an example of how the Netherlands embraced religious toleration. Even beyond that, Catholics and Jews enjoyed religious toleration in the Dutch Republic, but they did have fewer rights. Regardless, Jews were not forced to live in separate neighborhoods like ghettos, uh, like they were in most other European cities. Uh, again, the Netherlands were one of the few states, especially in Western Europe, that had this level of religious toleration. And this religious toleration enabled the Netherlands to foster a cosmopolitan society uh, that promoted trade. So when we talk about the idea of cosmopolitan, that means sort of, you know, wealthy and affluent, advanced, multicultural. I like think of like New York City. New York City is a very cosmopolitan city. Think of uh, Constantinople during the Middle Ages, right? So these big, booming metropolis. That's what the Netherlands kind of became in a lot of ways with this cosmopolitan society. And this religious toleration was also one of the things that contributed to its population boom. Since the Netherlands were one of the few states in Western Europe that allowed for this religious toleration, there were tons of refugees, religious refugees from other countries, that fled to the Netherlands and established their livelihoods there, especially Huguenots from France um, or religious minorities from the southern Netherlands, which is Belgium, basically. Anabaptists from the Holy Roman Empire came and were able to enjoy religious toleration in the Netherlands. And again, with this population boom, because of these religious refugees and other factors, the Netherlands became one of Europe's most densely populated areas in the 17th century. All right, another important point about the Netherlands, and this is really what I think is 
the most important factor, quite frankly. Like this is what creates their golden age. So the Netherlands became the greatest mercantile nation of the 17th century. So mercantile means like sea trade. So they just dominated sea trade and many trading networks. And as a result, they became very, very wealthy. So innovations in banking and finance promoted the growth of urban financial centers and a money economy in the Netherlands. The Netherlands became the new financial capital of Europe after Italy declined in the 1400s and early 1500s. So again, Italy, you might remember, was once the commercial center of Europe, especially during the later Middle Ages and the Renaissance. But as they declined in the 16th century, the Netherlands replaced them as this clear financial capital of Europe, specifically the city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam became this banking and commercial center of Europe, this incredibly wealthy cosmopolitan city. It replaced Antwerp, which had been another Dutch city that had dominated in the late 16th century. Um, Antwerp still continued to be an important city, but Amsterdam was bigger, it was richer, it was more powerful, all of that. It was the richest city in Europe, in fact, and in the 17th century, it had a population of over 100,000 people. And at the time, that's a lot of people. That's a really big city. Another thing that put Am that made Amsterdam notable is it had the Bank of Amsterdam, which might seem obvious, but what's notable about this, what's significant about it, is this is the first central bank in European history. And what we mean by a central bank is it's essentially like a state-sponsored bank. Uh, so it's a state-sponsored bank. It has more protection, more guarantees. It helps to regulate the overall economy and um, other private banks, which can be more um, unstable potentially. And most other banks that we've talked about, like the Medici Bank or the Fuggers or something like that, those were private banks. So this is the first like kind of public state-sponsored banks in European history. And one of the reasons it was successful is that it offered far lower interest rates than English banks. And this was really the biggest reasons for its dominance. Now, interest rates are how banks generally make money. They charge you interest on loans, business loans, house loans, which is a mortgage, car loans, student loans, all those type of things. And the interest is sort of like what you have to pay the bank for um, borrowing that money. And the way they made themselves competi com competitive is they had lower interest rates, which may seem like they weren't making as much money, but those lower interest rates attracted more customers. So in the end, they actually were making more money. Now, one cool other cool thing about Amsterdam, if you look at the photograph here, you'll see that there's a canal, right? There's these beautiful, colorful houses, and there's a canal. So Amsterdam has these canals all throughout the city, kind of like Venice, but, uh, but also different, not, not quite as extensive as Venice. But still, these canals were designed to expand the size of the city and also allow for easy transportation of trading goods. So this is actually urban planning designed to support the merchant activity and the, and the maritime focus of the Dutch economy. So you see these big flat boats right there. Basically, in the 17th century, merchants could bring their boat right up to the sidewalk in front of their house to unload trade goods. And you can see these houses might be kind of narrow, but they're also several stories tall. And that's because they usually had a few floors designated as storage for the goods that they might be selling or buying or trading or whatever. Um, so as you can see, the city really was designed fundamentally to promote this maritime mercantile culture. Today, this makes Amsterdam a really, really beautiful city with canals everywhere and bikes and trees and all that type of stuff. All right, more on the this great mercantile na uh, nation. Um, one of the un sort of drawbacks, I guess you could say, that the Netherlands had is that because they were a small country, they really had to rely on commerce. That means trade, since 
they didn't really have a lot of their own natural resources. Uh, and you'll find this is the case with case with lots of small countries. They have to import a lot of stuff because they don't have as many resources. And that's why sometimes smaller countries are really expensive. Like one of the most expensive countries I personally have ever been to is Liechtenstein, which is tiny. It is smaller than Tucson. And it was so expensive, and that's because everything has to be imported. It's also right next to Switzerland, which is also a very expensive country. Also because it's small and things have to be imported, but other reasons as well that we won't get into now. So the Dutch, as a result, had the largest fleet in the world dedicated to trade. So they had something like thousands and thousands of ships. I have this, this number somewhere in my notes. I'll get there eventually. Something like 16,000 ships. Yeah, 16,000 merchant ships by the, by the mid-17th uh, century. So that's a lot of ships. And as we know from studying the Age of Exploration, they had several outstanding ports that became hubs of European trades, not only the city of Amsterdam and other coastal areas in the Netherlands, but they also controlled key port cities on major trade routes, like in South Africa and India and the Spice Islands. We know that they basically pushed out the Portuguese and dominated a lot of that trade in the Eastern Hemisphere. And because trade was such an important, I mean, an essential part of their economy and ultimately their, their survival and their identity, uh, the government would not interfere with that free enterprise. So other countries at this time tend to see a lot more government interference in the economy or monopolies that might interfere with free enterprise. But the Netherlands had a very hands-off approach. Like it let, it let private businessmen do their thing and make their money. England was very much the same way. Uh, fishing, obviously, is going to be a big cornerstone of the Dutch economy because it is such a coastal nation, as you could see on the previous uh, slide with the, the map of the provinces. But they also had other industries. They were really good at uh, taking uh, raw materials and transforming them into finished goods. Um, so industries like textiles, furniture, fine woolen goods, sugar refining, tobacco cutting, brewing, that means brewing beer, pottery, glass, printing, paper making, weapon manufacturing, and shipbuilding. So they had their own well-developed manufacturing industries in addition to dominating trade. You might remember that I've called them the FedEx of Europe. And in addition to dominating the spice trade and the slave trade, so some of the most profitable trade routes in the world, especially in the 17th century. Now, one of the things that really defines uh, Dutch trade and Dutch financial power were its joint stock companies, specifically the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company. Of the two, the East India Company was definitely the bigger and more powerful one. These began as joint stock companies, but they're also really kind of like these, these major corporations um, that were organized as cooperative ventures with some private enterprise, but also somewhat sponsored by the state. Like we really do not see these exact type of organizations reproduced in today's economic world. Usually we have just solely private companies that might be multinational and very, very powerful and, and wealthy, but nothing kind of like this hybrid that the Dutch East India Company became. But this is what really allowed the Dutch to dominate. The Dutch East India Company had their own military, their own shipbuilding industry, their own banking services. I mean, they were an enormous institution. And this is what allowed them to challenge the Portuguese. And as I said, the Dutch pushed out the Portuguese from Indonesia. They pushed them out from India, from Sri Lanka, South Africa, and seized control of that spice trade. And again, that's why the Dutch East India Company was so large and so wealthy, because spices were worth their weight in gold. And we're talking spices like pepper and uh, nutmeg and cinnamon, because spices were used to make food taste good and also to preserve food. Uh, the Dutch East India Company is actually the wealthiest 
sort of financial business institution to ever exist at it, at its peak its net worth was well over seven billion dollars now the Dutch West India Company was not as large but it traded extensively with Latin America and Africa it focused more on the slave trade uh, business and as I said, by 1700, the Dutch dominated the spice trade in Indonesia, which was really the cash cow of international trade and other parts of Asia. And they actually were a lot more successful than the Portuguese in their, in their trading ventures because they weren't as religious and aggressive about their religion as the Portuguese. And so they, they just had, generally just had an easier time working with with native peoples, although don't get me wrong, as Europeans, they were more than willing to, you know, blow some stuff up to get people in line if need be. Now, the last point I want to make about this, since we're talking about the Dutch economy, is that with all this wealth that came in from trade, it's important to know that the Dutch enjoyed the highest standard of living in Europe during the 17th century with higher wages and better diets than most other countries. So they had the highest standard of living. And this wealth would also allow for a flourishing of literary and artistic culture. This is one of the reasons this is called a golden age is because the art produced during this period is just beautiful and magnificent and something we'll talk about another day. So this map right here is important to include because it while it's a little bit blurry and I apologize for that poor resolution it does show us some of the major trade routes of the Dutch East India Company now we're only focusing on the Eastern Hemisphere um, and the East India Company because they were the, the more powerful one but you can see that they had major business in Indonesia in Sri Lanka and in India even in Arabia and you can see the type of things that were traded um, almost entirely luxury goods, things that were really, really expensive and really, really valuable. All right, last topic for this lecture is foreign policy. Now, ultimately, it, was, it would be wars combined with economic decline that would contribute to the overall decline of the Dutch Republic. Wars are expensive, that causes economic decline, those things tend to go hand in hand. So, one of the first major wars that the Dutch participated in as a more or less independent country was the Thirty Years' War, and they fought against the Habsburgs, because they once had been ruled by the Habsburgs, so this should not be surprising. But since they fought against the Habsburgs, and the Habsburgs didn't do well in the Thirty Years' War, uh, the Dutch were able to receive recognition as an independent country in the Treaty of Westphalia, completely free from Spanish influence. We mentioned that before. So that was great for the Dutch in a lot of ways, but like I said, war is expensive. So it did put a strain on their economy. Now, England is also going to emerge as a major competitor with the Dutch. Uh, the Netherlands and England have a lot in common. They're both constitutional countries. They both are very mercantile nations, meaning they, they focus on maritime, meaning sea-based trade. Uh, they both support free enterprise and the gentry and the bourgeoisie have a lot of influence, um, but that but their similarities also make them really fierce competitors. So England's navigation laws, which I'll explain in a moment, and their removal of the Dutch from New York reduced the Dutch economic and influence in North America. Now, the colonization of North America also turns out to be a major cash cow, especially for England, because as we know, they tend they dominated most of the colonies in North America. But even before the English, the Dutch had actually originally been the first Europeans to colonize the area we know as New York. Um, and we can actually still see some of that Dutch influence when we look at the names of some of the boroughs in New York City, like Manhattan, Harlem, Brooklyn. These are all Dutch names. But the England came along and pushed the Dutch out and seized control of that region and then eventually, of course, developed the 13 British colonies. Now, England also was bigger than the Netherlands. It had more resources, and this alone made it difficult for the Netherlands to sort of keep up with England, especially as the century progressed. Now, 
I mentioned the navigation laws, or they're sometimes called the navigation acts, and um, I'll take a moment to explain what those are, just so you, so you know. Um, the navigation acts were laws passed by Parliament in 1651. Now, if you think about that date, 1651, what was happening in England? Oh, it was the interregnum. Who was in charge? It was Cromwell, but it was still during the Commonwealth period, so there was still a parliament. This was actually like one of the, the really good things that Cromwell did for England. So Cromwell's parliament passed the navigation laws or navigation acts in 1651, and Part of the, the things that came from this is it stipulated that English goods had to be carried on English ships, which may not sound like such a big deal, but this is the kicker. That also, the English colonies of North America could only trade with England. So like I said, North America becomes like the, ca the other cash cow of the colonial trading world. And there's tons of resources that come out of North America, and these colonies in particular. And Britain had established an entire monopoly on that. So that, like I said, really reduced and limited the Dutch's econo uh, economic influence in North America. But the bigger issue, honestly, the real kicker um, when it comes to the decline of the Dutch Republic is frequent war with England and France in the 1670s that damaged the Dutch Republic. This, more than anything, would contribute to their economic decline. Now, by the time we get to the 1670s, Louis XIV is the king of France. He's a very powerful, absolute monarch. We're going to learn all about him in another lecture. And he believed that he deserved the Netherlands, both the southern Netherlands and the northern Netherlands. Uh, by this point, Spain had declined. It was really a second-rate country. France emerged from the Thirty Years' War as basically the most powerful country in all of Europe. And so Louis, was, as an ambitious monarch, was looking to expand his territory like any you know, good European monarch throughout history. He wanted more territory because territory equals power. But his argument for claiming the Netherlands is that he believed that they were part of what was owed to him from his wife's dowry. So he married a Spanish princess. Her dowry was some Spanish territory. Um, and so he made this big deal like, I deserve the Netherlands. I didn't get what I, what I was supposed to get. Rah, rah, rah. I'm a big, ambitious, powerful king that gets whatever he wants. All right. Every European monarch ever. More on that later. So he invaded the Netherlands multiple times. We'll see this when we talk about the wars of Louis XIV. And in one of the wars, when his French army is, attempt is attempting to invade the Netherlands, the Dutch will actually open the dikes in Holland. So the dikes are like the walls that keep out the, the ocean. Because remember, much of it is below sea level. So they have these walls built to keep out the ocean. They, they're still there. But to prevent the French from invading their country, they opened the dikes and flooded their capital city of Amsterdam, again, to prevent the French from taking it. Like, that's that's insane. Um, it's successful because the French are like, well, now we don't want this flooded city. But it's also, like, almost suicidal in a way because imagine the damage that that produces within Amsterdam, their capital city, their financial center, and how that might affect their economic stability. Also, you might remember that uh, Louis XIV had struck this secret deal with Charles II of England. Um, and that secret deal was mostly about Charles supporting Catholics in England and has a lot to do with that religious tension. But also, Charles supported the French in their fight against the Dutch. Um, remember, this was before William and Mary, so this is still when, the, when England really competed with the Dutch. Of course, when William and Mary, who came from the Netherlands, became the monarchs of England, that drastically reduced the conflict between England and the Netherlands. But that didn't happen until 1688. So we're, we're not there yet at this point in history. Right now, in the 1670s, the Dutch are getting their butt kicked by France, with, uh, and England is helping. OK. So by the end of the 17th century, and as we sort of wrap around into the 18th century, 
Um, they're one of the, the last big wars of that period is called the War of Spanish Succession, which I'll cover in another lecture when we talk about the wars of Louis XIV. But after the War of Spanish Succession, the Dutch Republic really saw a significant economic decline. At this point, Britain and France were now the two dominant powers in the Atlantic. They dominated triangular trade. They dominated the colonies. Um, the Dutch economy had suffered significantly because of tariffs. That's like a tax on imports. They had suffered because of these tariffs imposed by other countries that really made it difficult for them to sell and trade their manufactured goods. The expense of fighting the wars against France and England had also drained the economy. And frankly, the Netherlands were unable to compete with these larger countries that had more resources. So again, war, trade competition, um, the fact that they were a small country, all of this contributed to their economic decline and ultimately the end of their golden age. So in the 17th century, or sorry, in the 1700s, which is the 18th century, we will not see as much action from the Netherlands. And what's interesting is this also affects their religious toleration and their culture. Uh, they become less tolerant in religion with religious minorities in the 18th century. Um, their art also declines, the subject matter changes, it's not as prolific, but that's to be expected, right? When the, gold, when the golden age ends, that also will be felt in cultural areas as well, such as religion and art and other things like that. So anyways, that is it for, today, for today's lecture on the Netherlands. And I hope you enjoyed it. I do not have Bowie with me right now, but hopefully he will participate in a future lecture. Um, remember to get your notes done and bring them to class so that you get the stamp. And if you have any questions, make sure you write them down so that you can ask me in class. Thanks for listening.